what we are telling them is there is definitely a, a reinventive way of using technology and data uh, to understand what consumers are buying. Connor from Royal Handmade, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having us. Really interesting business, right? So, so in a nutshell, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? But basically, there's there's you know artisan makers all around the world are making these beautiful you know handmade products that are really sustainable, and you're trying to get them in to businesses so they can sell them to the general public. Absolutely. Was that all right? Was That's pretty good. Pretty <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. So what's yeah. your what's your version of it? Was that yeah, different? our version <laughs> of it is actually very simple. We're trying to connect rural artisan communities across the world to the global consumer market, and we do this with the help of data and design. Right. Okay. So. A question I, I had for you off camera, because I was super curious from, from, from when I got the email intro to you, is that how do you find these artists and makers? It, I, that's what I couldn't get my head around. Like, how do you find these hundreds of people or thousands of people that are making these products you know, in, in developing countries? How do, you, how do you find them? What ways it work? Right. So I think the, 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 the answer to that question is pretty straightforward now, especially because of ICT penetration, which is basically internet communications and technology uh, mm. you know, platforms like WhatsApp. Uh, it's a, it's a two-way strategy we have. So we, we partner with the local governments. So for example, the government of India, government of Nepal, government of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. All of these governments have a huge database of these artisan communities, which is basically in massive numbers. So just in Southeast Asia, you have between 120 to 130 million makers. Uh, the second thing we do is, uh, because they have the database that they have, we then have use WhatsApp and, and local community partners to reach out to these people. So they probably might be living in the remotest of the places of these different different countries, but because of low technology device like the mobile phones and the cheap internet they have, we can reach out to them and, and then build the community we have. Very cool. And how difficult is it logistics wise to, to get these people on the platform, to get the images on the platform and then to get the people paid? And how, how, does, all, how does all that work? Is that quite a big challenge? Right. So what we've done is basically we've kept it very simple. Uh, our makers just make and we do the rest. So basically, makers' main job is to meet the high, highest quality standards we have as a company, because eventually it's a con consumer in London or New York that's going to basically appreciate the work, and he has to see the detailing of the work that the artisan has put in. Mm. So they only make, we partner with the local uh, transporters, uh, local uh, champions, uh, local uh, small SME companies, and they help us basically uh, stock everything in a centralized warehousing. Right, so we work on a zero inventory model, so when we get the orders from our B2B partners, we then seamlessly take the orders to our uh, clusters or communities, they make, and then the local transporters basically help us uh, take the products from different, different small clusters to a central warehousing. And from there, we then pack it in the container, and then it sails to uh, wherever the destination is, in the yeah. Western Europe or uh, North America. And I'm guessing the makers you know, say how much that the, you know, each unit or each product is. To then the end user, which which in this case is you know businesses and, and, and retailers, do they do they decide what the recommended retail price? They they, they decide the retail price. Is that correct? Yeah. So we, we don't command and we don't define what you would be selling it as, uh, but obviously uh, we have tried to reinvent the fair trade uh, supply chain. You know the fair trade is basically you pay fair wages and and a little bit more. What we are saying is right now if we can actually create a system in which we can actually get them to uh, you know put the money in the insurance schemes, in the healthcare schemes, in the pension schemes, these artisans feel a lot more obliged to work for us. Okay, of course. Because we're basically doing exactly what the governments uh, 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 deal with the people here in the West. It's basically the same principle. So, so this is what we want to do basically. It's not just pay them fair wages, but also do a lot more. And what people uh, keep as a price to their product, we don't really bother much in that because it's handmade products. Uh, and, and your design also plays an important role on, on the price. We're just basically executing or commissioning designs. Yeah, of course. Basically. Because it isn't, you know, it wouldn't be the fairest thing in the world if a, an artisan designer got paid the equivalent of one pound for a sculpture and then someone selling it for 3,000 when it gets to Correct. New York, you know. So do you look at, you don't, do you don't track the, the, the last bit, you don't track the, the sale at the last bit, do you? You track everything else, as in, as in, because you had mentioned about using data to see what the consumer behavior is and what are they buying to feed back in 
So do you use the last bit of like how much things are selling for? Is that not come into it? Right. So the data part basically uh, focuses not much on the on the pricing part, mm -hmm. but it basically focuses on how do you map the consumer's buying behavior. Okay. What we eventually want to do is basically build advanced machine learning algorithms to understand uh, what do people buy in, in, in the region and, and what are their uh, habits like. Because this data actually eventually then travels to our business partners who are basically retailers. So I'll give you an example. If a retail is a 3,000 square feet space, even in 2019, for some reason, retailers use the touch and feel concept to yeah. procure products when they go to trade shows. Mm. What we are telling them is there is definitely a, a reinventive way of using technology and data uh, to understand what consumers are buying right now. And we, in a very fast and frugal process, can help you procure the products, which are not just handmade, but also sustainable, mm. with the army of you know, millions and millions of makers we have uh, in, in under the rural handmade, uh, rural handmade ambit. What's it like dealing with uh, governments? Because obviously it comes up quite a bit, in different capacities obviously, but a lot of like fintech companies here will have to deal with governments and companies uh, you know, going abroad to say want to launch in Asia, dealing with governments. What's it like from your point of view, getting in and getting that data and working with governments? Yeah. So I think it really works well for us because I think of uh, two or three factors I can give you an example of. So. Uh, first of all, Handmade is the second largest employer in the world. And so basically for most of these governments in the developing nations, uh, they're a massive vote bank. Mm. And uh, governments, I believe very firmly that they genuinely want to help them get some kind of an employment, right? And what we are, basically what Rural Handmade is, it is a shared prosperity project in which what we are saying is that if the global handmade industry is half a trillion, and almost 70% of the products are made in the developing world and their market share including of SMEs and large companies is between 2 to 3% mm. there's definitely a disconnect right so governments generally want to help them but i think the the problem is the lack of innovation so the current status is all these makers are overproducing craft that nobody needs yeah yeah of course and we want to invert this we want to say how could we use this extremely skilled army of people to make designs that are more relevant for today's generation. Did you raise, uh, raise money to get the business off the ground or was it bootstrapped or what way have you? It's been bootstrapped till now. Uh, we have a team of about 15 people, half of them are interns. We obviously are headquartered here in London, uh, but we have an office in New Delhi, okay. which basically manages the Southeast Asia operations from Nepal, India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, and we are looking to raise money. Um, so, so we have been bootstrapped and I think now we've taken the business uh, to a level where we think we can now raise money. Uh, the proof of concept has already been proven. Mm -hmm. We have sold close to 5,000 products in the last 12 to 18 months. And so now it's a time to kind of expand and, and then reach out and, and acquire more businesses. Of course. Well, it's super cool. Wish you the best with the raise. Well, I'll link the website below so everyone can go on the vlog. But thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you very much, Richard. Cheers. Cheers, Graham. Thanks.